plethora of them. Um, moderating orbital coordinations, part one and two, and there will be a break in between because we know, you know it's hard to sit for so long, is actually one of Mariba's students. Vishnu Malik is a second year PhD student here at UT in aerospace engineering, and he specializes in orbital mechanics and estimation. So he's probably going to answer some of the questions that were just put forward by our colleagues from STRATCOM. Uh, he, his research is focused on characterizing resident space objects using non-resolved electro-optical data. So he's really um, a, quite a wonderful person to be moderating some of the really provocative research that you are going to listen to. And I promise you it's all space for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Howard, for the uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you for the audience for being here. Uh, it's a very interesting session. We got a lot of talks on space object characterization, data analysis, and ontologies. And we'd like to start off with uh, Dr. Mariba Jha's presentation. So Dr. Jha, please welcome Dr. Mariba Jha. Uh, I'd actually like to request the entire uh, panel, which is the people presenting in this session, to come down here and please have a seat. Thank you so much. All right, uh, anyway, I decided to borrow this microphone. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, very much. And I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Uh, Unmil Karadkar was going to present this, and um, he's had some personal issues that have come up, so he asked me if I could uh, do the honor, so I'm going to go through this quite quickly. So I'm going to talk to you about this thing called astrograph. We're going to talk about these things called ontologies. And hopefully, by the time I'm done in the next 10 minutes, you'll have more of an appreciation for the importance of uh, how to manage and how to engineer data uh, to make it accessible in a way where you can analyze it and it can uh, provide some, some use uh, when it comes to space situational awareness. So <clears throat> one of the things that we developed here uh, in collaboration with a few others is this thing called Astrograph. And basically, if you, go to, if you just Google this, you go to Astrograph, you can see this website. <clears throat> And it has multiple sources of information. And you can, you can think of these as opinions. These are all opinions about stuff in space, opinions about stuff in space. And so what this does is it brings in multiple sources of information, maps this into a common uh, knowledge graph database, call it a, a, a lingua franca, if you will, uh, where all our beliefs reside. But we have multiple opinions that we can show in a common framework. Uh, if you click on an object, uh, you should see whose, whose opinion uh, is, is represented, and you can get some ideas of orbits and all this other stuff. So it's kind of a you know, zeroth level kind of understanding of things in space. But that's what you see when you go to the website. Really, what are we kind of talking about here? So we'd like to increase the diversity of data. These are just a, uh, uh, an examples of a couple of sources uh, that we have coming in here, and all this is automated. So we have multiple sources of information, from that, we try to uh, derive a couple of salient attributes or features uh, that are common uh, to, to those different sources. Uh, there's structured and unstructured information. This is, these are examples of structured data. But basically, we, we don't ask people to provide stuff in a specific format. Uh, one of the things that I tell people is, you know, how many people here in the audience have been approached by Google asking you to provide Google with specific information about yourself in a specified format? Raise the hands, anybody? Really, Google approach you, Matt? Okay, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk later. We'll talk later, man, because if they're approaching you, we, you, got, you got some problems, bro. So anyway, so the thing is, Google just goes out there and just grabs stuff. 
And so the thing is, if anybody says no to anything about something going on in space, it's, you've lost. Uh, it, it, you know, that, that's failure. So we need to be able to grab everything possible about what's going on in space, and then we should have the burden to map that to a common framework, and this is where uh, community uh, comes into play. So we have a couple of you know, reference frames, that sort of stuff uh, represented. Two key challenges, this idea of sustainability and scalability. When I say sustainability, I'm not just talking about um, the representation of objects in space, but I'm also talking about the semantics. We have a way to describe stuff. We don't even agree. When we say SSA, it means different things to different people. When we say orbit, not everybody agrees. Uh, you know, when we, say, when we say resident space object, when we say debris, we don't even completely agree on that. I know that uh, there are some bodies that are working on standards. We've got ISO working on stuff. But there's a lot about SSA that we don't uh, really agree upon yet. And even when we do have specific terms, we have what's called semantic drift, meaning that over time, the definition of that term could change as well. And so you need to track the semantic drift of things. Okay? Scalability. How do you continuously absorb and add more and more information? So these are two big challenges. Kind of the approach that we have here, so there's this thing called ontologies. Just think of this as a way to semantically describe a domain with relationships. And so this is f uh, fundamental in data engineering and representation. Here's what we want. The best thing that we could provide to everybody on planet Earth is curated data. What do I mean by curated data? I mean you bring in some data, you interpret that, you put that in a way that has some standards, some definitions, again, a common kind of vernacular. You're keeping track of things, not just uh, technically, but semantically, and providing curated information to people. Curated information, key thing, okay? Um, anyway, let me move on here in the, sp in, 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 uh, the spirit of time. So uh, our philosophy is Try to define all concepts unambiguously. That's really hard. Let me give you an example, okay? Uh, there was this person at uh, University of Colorado that was trying to fly a UAV in this room based on sensor data and human input. The sensor data was a LIDAR, LIDAR uh, system in one corner. Couldn't see everything in the room. And then there was three windows. Three windows, just like you see on, uh, there in the back. And there was a human with a microphone, just like me, behind each window. And there's obstacles in the room. And the humans are helping fly this UAV in the room. One person saying, oh, that's going to hurt. Somebody else is saying, oh, watch out. Oh, you got an obstacle there. So, mm, that's going to hurt. Watch out. And there's an obstacle meant the same thing. So, when it comes to physical sensors, there's a technical challenge in fusing data. But now imagine, as soon as you expand that to human-based inputs, even in the English language, multiple things can translate to the same stuff. How do you map that to a common manifold for fusion? That is where there's a huge challenge, and I don't think people are addressing that. Okay? Um, this is an example of, of an ontology model that we put together. Again, semantic relationships be between things, because we want to be able to bring disparate sources of information together and link these things to discover some relationships. So this is one example of something that we did based on orbit and physical features and, and, and that sort of thing. And just given a, an example from some, some entity, some owner, just again, trying to properly label. And when you're trying to keep track of things, it's not just keeping track of things in space, but again, of the terminology. And we shouldn't be rewriting any information. We shouldn't be deleting stuff. We should always be adding. So this is like entropy. Like entropy is, is always increasing, so, so the size of astrograph and this knowledge graph should always be increasing because, you know, uh, stor storage these days is cheap. So we shouldn't be saying, oh, well, you know, we can't, can't, can't pay for storage. So we need, a, we need to think of keeping things in perpetuity because we might come up with different methods to evaluate that uh, as a function of time. And let me just kind of get through here so we can get to the next folks. So um, having a controlled vocabulary, being able to say, we're going to give a freeze to our definitions just so that we can, you know, if, there, if things are a moving target, if every time you're trying to bring in new people, the definitions start changing, guess what happens? You can't get to where you want to get to. So the thing is, you need to agree on a common set of terminology and vernacular and definitions and freeze that, at least for some portion of time, to build community 
figure out what's the ne what the next step is, and then you can have different versions. But you can't just have the sliding window of definitions and terms and, and, and that sort of stuff, because then you don't get to this kind of the, the place where we want to get to where uh, a good group, group of people can make sense uh, out of everything up there. So next steps, basically, uh, so we have, I told you about different opinions. So whose opinion is right? One of the things that I ask people is, how do you know that you have the world's most accurate clock? Anybody? You have a whole bunch of clocks. You're so good at this, man. Right? And so the thing is, what we want is we want massive quantities of disparate and independent sources of information so that we can figure out what the berry center of that is and say, that's what we're going to say is the best knowledge that we have about this object. What is the weighted combination of all these different sources uh, to get us to safety, security, and sustainability of the space domain. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ja. Our next presenter is Professor Roberto Furfaro from the University of Arizona. Uh -huh. Professor Furfaro is the uh -huh. director of the Space Situation Awareness Initiative at the sure. University of Arizona. Yeah, it works, it works. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Let me. One of those. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right, so this is a little bit of a continuation, uh, also contrast uh, the approach that Moriba was presenting. What we saw before with ontology is a knowledge representation, right through uh, very much what is our understanding of the problem. Now, uh oh, he is running. Hold on, just a sec. <laughs> Let me go into a different mode. Yeah. Let's do a full screen. It'll work better. All right. So, um, however, you know, there is another modality, which is extracting information directly from the data. And I have a system learning about it, right? And indeed, one of the things that I'm going to be talking, more specifically in this talk, is how can we apply deep learning um, to the problem of uh, space object characterization. And I'll specifically focus on a problem. How can you use light curve to extract information out of it? All right, I don't have to convince you this. This is a kind of a uh, motivating, uh, uh, motivating slide. That's my chart. That's your chart? Uh, we, see, I knew you were coming, so I just tried to homage you. Right. So, but uh, most important thing is that, you know, this 29,000 objects continuing growing, uh, the one that we're tracking, estimated 500,000 objects less than one centimeter. Uh, we all know what it means for space traffic management. So the big part is going to be how can we characterize and understanding the behavior of these objects, right? So one component is, uh, as one, one possible uh, modality, is to use like curves to uh, have a, some sort of classification of the space object. Now, this is generally possible. Here, for example, I give you an idea about the different light curves that you can have for different type of objects. For, for a geosatellite, for example, some pointing, uh, the solar panel, a rotating spin stabilized uh, bus in LEO, an uncontrolled rocket body. So just intuitively, if you look at that, it seems like they have light curves, so you should be able to somehow come up with something that discriminates, right? Now, now, how do you do? This is a little bit of a wordy uh, uh, chart, but how do you do this? Well, you have different type of approaches. The one is one possibility is a model-based type of approach. Basically, what you do, you understand the physics, you write a model that represents your physics, and then, uh, given the data, you invert the model. Basically, you do an estimation, right? And the uh, whatever is the estimator techniques that you use, um, you know, the idea is that use the estimator. Uh, to classify the data. The contrast to this is a data-driven approach where you have a bunch of data and you want to find patterns in the data, right? And use those patterns, or also sometimes called features, um, to uh, basically uh, understand, uh, uh, classify basically the, the data. Of course, you have two types of approach. One is a supervised, sometimes called imitation learning, and the other is unsupervised. The supervised, basically, somebody labels the data for you and you try to map out the relationship that is generally unknown 
between uh, the data and the class associated to the data. Unsupervised, instead, you just look for patterns, for example, clusters in the data. Okay, so here what I want to show you is a, a purely uh, data-driven approach, and basically, uh, we're going to use one of these uh, uh, techniques uh, that are at the heart of uh, deep learning, and everybody heard about deep learning. It's now becoming per uh, per uh, you know, pervasive everywhere. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about how we can apply convolutional neural network and also additional type. Oh, I didn't realize that. Let me go back. Sorry, guys. I just realized that this is... The slideshow, can you see? No. Okay, never mind. So it looks like it's cut. So bear with me, try to do my best. Okay. All right, so bottom line is that show some uh, uh, how these convolutional networks can be trained, you know, to, uh, uh, to basically classify data based on like curves information. Okay, this is. Uh, uh, a convolutional net, uh, uh, convolutional neural network architecture. Basically, what you have here is a, a, a neural network made up of many neurons with many layers with a spatial architecture. Basically, each layer represents uh, convolutional layers, which is basically a set of filters, and these filters are able to automatically extract information from the data. And uh, the big uh, innovation about this was also the use of uh, of a stochastic gradient descents that over the past 10 years were shown to be able to uh, avoid that during the learning process uh, the system would be stuck in a local minimum. Um, so we, ha we have a couple of phases here. It's a little bit cut off, but um, the, uh, the, phase, uh, the phase here is basically, first phase is that, okay, we have a model, right? It's a light curve model. Uh, so we use light curves with the, with the, uh, with the model of the uh, different type of spacecraft, for example, rocket body, cuboids, regular, regular, or irregular. We give them a state of motion, and we generate artificially, basically, through a reflectance model, a bunch of light curves, right? And then the first phase will be, okay, train the model based on these light curves, okay? So we do this. Uh, actually, let me get out. Let's see. Is it better? Uh, sorry. <laughs> Then aspect this. Okay, maybe we can do this artificially. Okay, so in this case, we considered uh, three examples uh, an uncontrolled bus, a controlled bus, and uncontrolled rocket bodies. And uh, for each one, we define different uh, type of motion. Okay, and we end up generating something like nine uh, classes. And for each classes, we trained basically about uh, a thousand cases. So we generated the thousand light curves, right? And uh, we used that for training set, and then we generated other 2,000 classes, uh, basically uh, other 2,000 cases, light curves associated for, uh, for just the validation of this, okay? And uh, then in this case, what we end up doing, we come up with the, uh, a network architecture. Uh, that the one that you see here is basically made up of uh, uh, something like seven layers. You have three, basically, an input layer and an output layer that tells you the probability of the uh, light curves to be uh, which classes, you know, of the nine classes. Input layer is, of course, the light curve. And in the middle, you have different convolutional layers, um, uh, three different convolutional layers and two fully connected layers, okay, with that architecture. Um, here, uh, a little bit the training results. On the left side, you see the model loss. That is basically, the, the loss represents basically, uh, it's, it's called in this case cross entropy. But basically what it tells you, it tells you the, the function that you want to minimize. You know, it's the, somehow the error between the output of your network and the training points that you bring up. On the right side, you see the model accuracy. Overall, with this training set specifically, we get to a 97.93% accuracy over you know, 12,000 basically um, cases. Um, then we compare this with standard techniques, which is, for example, uh, a random forest-like technique. This is a non-neural network technique, but it's still a, a classifier. It's pretty much state-of-the-art, what they call non-deep networks. Uh, it's a bunch of decision trees. In this case, we have 100. We get to an accuracy comparable, 96.8%. 
and SVM get to, uh, support vector machine gets to 95.3%. So accuracy in this case seems to be comparable. So it doesn't look like at this point that you, uh, you have an advantage in having a deep network. However, things change when we use real data. In this case, uh, specifically, uh, we got this uh, uh, real light curves taken from this uh, Russian telescope called Multi-Channel Monitoring Telescope. The data set is freely available, so they made them up there. We just grab the data and just use it. And in this case, uh, we took the data, we did quite a bit of curation, and we used basically three possible classes. We classify this based on three possible classes, debris, rocket body, and satellites. It's a combination of things between LEO, MEO, and GEO. Um, and in this case, what we did, um, each Likert, by the way, has 500, um, 500 samples. So I think every, everything is spaced by 30 seconds. And uh, uh, we took something like uh, uh, about uh, 119,000 uh, observations for training and almost 30,000 observations for testing. In this case, the output of the network was only three classes. We used the same architecture as before. Here what we get. Here the deep network, we were able to get to 77% uh, uh, on the training set. Um, as you see that the, on, the testi- on the testing set, on the training set, which is the blue curve, we got almost 80%, okay? But you have a, 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 you know, a variation between these two. That means that basically there is a little bit of overfitting, but that's the best what the, na- uh, the network was able to do. In this case, for example, for this case on a GPU quadro, uh, uh, 5,000 class, it took eight hours for training. However, and here's the big deal, we compared this with the standard technique as before, and as you see, the standard techniques do much, much less. State-of-the-art, uh, non-deep network, non-deep technique, back decision tree does a 62% accuracy on the, on the training, and uh, 40, uh, SVM does be really bad, 44, uh, 44% for, you know, accuracy, so... Um, then we tried to do also another technique. On, on top of the uh, convolution neural network, we also took a recurrent network. A recurrent network is a different type of architecture where you don't input all the light curve at the time, but you input the light curve as a sequence, okay? And then uh, supposedly, you know, supposed to, you know, potentially get better and have the information there. What well, we see, we see quite a bit of overfitting here. Actually, on the blue, with the same training set, as you saw before, no, actually in this case we used the yeah, 10, uh, 10K, uh, yeah, 12K samples. As you see, with the blue curve we got above 90%. I think it was 94%. However, on the testing set, with the, 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 the set where you didn't train on, as you see it stays around 60%. So there is a quite a bit of, over, of overfitting. That is, the system doesn't learn outside of the training points that you give them. Uh, however, we are investigating this. Part of the problem is that we think that w- we use face, you know, we took face value basically all the information that was given to us uh, from the um, uh, from the uh, you know the, the 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 data. Basically, when we uh, uh, downloaded the data, there were metadata attached that directly tell told us it's a debris, it's a it's not a debris or it's a, it's, a, it's a rocket body and so on. So uh, we suspect there might be some issue with that, and that's probably why we, we overtrain. Um, uh, important thing, we also did some sort of clustering. Now, each light curve has 500 components, okay? So what we did, we apply uh, some statistical technique called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. Basically, this is a sophisticated nonlinear uh, principal component analysis type that is able to reduce all the data into a three-dimensional space. Sorry, we're out of time. Yeah, just let me, let me close this. And, uh, and uh, so basically, the bottom line is that what you see, you see that on the right side, uh, you have that the nine classes are plotted in two dimension, okay? And you see there is a relatively good separation between the two, but in three, in the case of the real data, uh, the embedding, they're all confused. So the deep network is able to find the, the decision boundaries between two, uh, that, uh, those two better, but it's not able to completely cut it off. Okay? All right. And I'm out of time. Those are the conclusion. We're continuing working on this. So and hopefully you'll see more results on this later. Okay. Thank, Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Furfuro. Our next speaker is Justin Spurbeck, a graduate student at the University of Texas, working with Dr. Marie Baja. His interests are in orbital mechanics estimation with applications to maneuver detection, estimation, and characterization. Can you guys hear me all right? Good? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Vish. Uh, like you just stated, my name is Justin Spurbeck. I'm a second year graduate student here at the uh, University of Texas under Dr. Ja. And uh, it's an honor to be here talking to you guys today. Um, excited to talk to you about photoacoustic signatures, what they are, and how they can help us with uh, satellite event detection and characterization. So first and foremost, a couple of acknowledgments here, specifically Dan and Rex for giving us the initial idea of uh, the uh, light to sound conversion, as well as everyone else here who helped out with some of the experimental uh, data we collected here. Couldn't have done it without them. So uh, apologies, may be going through a little bit of this somewhat quick due to the time constraints here, but um, definitely open for questions if there's anything um, desired there. So near real-time satellite event detection, what exactly do we mean by that? Um, the bulk of this research focuses on active satellites and detecting their events and the um, estimation that comes along with it. Uh, of all the events, this research focuses mainly on maneuvers. Um, the ideal application for this and some basic assumptions are that it's ideal for active three-axis stabilized spacecraft. Um, we assume that we're taking nighttime observations with optical telescopes, so essentially taking light curve data. Um, and then the other assumption and key assumption here is that whatever event we observe, we're able to observe the, the genesis, duration, and termination of that event. Um, whenever I say near real-time detection, um, what I mean by that is saying the detection of any event is limited by only the speed of light and your data processing workflow. And then I'll get into what the, the near real-time estimation means later here. But specific to satellite maneuvers, um, you can see there's a range of delta Vs there, slightly cut off on the right, and uh, a range of techniques. Um, typically, for the active techniques, you can get about 15 minutes with the uh, optical tracking and sequential estimation uh, that you see there in the second row. Um, there are some uh, newer methods that I've uncovered that, uh, by Excel Analytics, for example, that have been able to detect thruster plumes at geo, essentially in near real time, but some of those are lucky and they don't always... Um, uh, they aren't exhaustive. So the theory here, again, is event detection. How did we simulate this? Um, essentially, we took a very simplistic box wing model here um, and assumed that some sort of satellite, active satellite event, such as a thruster fire, induces some energy into the not completely rigid satellite body, which then vibrates or induces energy again into that satellite. And in doing so, it modulates the outgoing light. So I, I did a basic simulation here that modulates the area unit vectors to see if that change in outgoing photon flux could be detected in a synthetic light curve. Um, so we did do a simulation here using a cook torrance reflectance model. Um, the atmospheric noise assumption was a Gaussian distribution on the apparent visual magnitude, um, specifically on the, on, the, on the good end of the standard deviations for that noise effect on the visual magnitude. Um, we had a good source in industry that helped us uh, kind of point towards those values that are realistic. And as you can see from two to four seconds there, um, you see a signal show up. Um, you will also notice, though, at the top of the figure, it says that's an eight-centimeter displacement required on the satellite body to produce a signal that you can detect. And likely unrealistic for a properly designed satellite. Um, so instead of designing a full macro model with material properties, we just ran a range of values to see what is the smallest detection or vibration on board a satellite that we can detect with this method. So on the top left, you can see a very large, unrealistic 35-centimeter displacement. If you imagine a solar panel, uh, you know, vibrating at that level, you easily detect it's so strong you can see some 2N harmonics showing up there. The 8 case on the top right, 3 centimeters on the bottom left, and then 2 centimeters, you, lose, you visually lose this in a spectrogram. We didn't want to stop there, so we wanted to see can we pull any signals out of the atmospheric noise? Um, and the noise really is a limiting assumption here. So we tried both cross-correlation and a uh, more traditional FFT approach. And as you can see in the top right and the one next to it uh, up here, that you do see an event signal show up. Um, 
reducing it down to a 7 millimeter displacement, you can still pretty much barely pull it out of the noise here. The FFT has uh, some challenges down here for reasons we won't get too far into today. Uh, it's cut off, but there are other peaks that it can't distinguish from here. But um, also, if you use the best case atmospheric noise assumption, you can get essentially down to a 5 millimeter detection uh, peak deflection. So think the end of the solar panel tip uh, moving five millimeters. That's what we've shown in simulation with these atmospheric noise assumptions that we can detect. So what does that mean? What, what can we do with the detection? Um, the beauty of knowing when an event starts and ends is that you can apply some basic physics principles to uh, estimate things such as potentially mass and mass flow rate, which we'll get into. But particularly, assuming you get the event start and end time, it helps you very accurately estimate the delta V uh, direction and maneuver type. Uh, we partnered with a company in Australia who has a constellation in GEO, and they gave us real data to compare against, and we were able to estimate those values to the estimation accuracy limited uh, listed on the screen there. Uh, so again, getting into more of the estimation here, one of the challenges before in many different uh, maneuver detection and estimation uh, methodologies is what you didn't have the start and end times of the event. Some of the error bounds for these events epics were plus or minus half an orbit. And if you plug those air bounds into these equations, which are just the basic conservation of orbital energy and momentum, uh, you can get things such as negative mass. And the, the, area, the, the air is too large. But having a direct timestamp allows you to estimate these things. Unfortunately, these equations aren't uh, linearly independent, so you need an a priori mass estimate. But if you do have that for an object, you're able, and assuming you do have the event epics, you can estimate things such as mass flow rate, and the other values up here in this table. Again, we did have the real values from the satellite operator in GEO that we worked with. We were able to estimate the mass flow rate, ISP, uh, fuel consumed, and even a ballpark for the exhaust velocity by, by knowing these values. Again, you need an a priori mass estimate for this to, to work. Um, one of the things that may come of this, which could be useful from a sort of a monitoring standpoint, is if you have this sort of monitoring capability, you could potentially, um, after you know the technology is proven, monitor fuel consumption over time for an object. Say there's an uncooperative object in GEO, you've, you've audited their fuel, you know how much they've spent over the past amount of, X amount of time, you can say, hey, you, you're getting close to your end of life, make sure you get to your graveyard orbit. You know, things like that, some sort of proper um, monitoring aspect there, as well as even potentially constraining what type of thruster is on board by, by or at least eliminating what aren't, what isn't on board by getting the specific impulse there. Um, there's some other drive properties there on the right there that can also be uh, estimated. So photoacoustic signatures, what is this all about? Um, essentially, the human ear can hear anywhere from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And if you collect uh, light curve data or photometric data, at a, the, the, in the human audible range, around 50 kilohertz, you can convert that to an acoustic signal. So we define the photoacoustic signature as essentially the acoustic playback of the high-rate photometric data. Now, why does this matter? And why, don't, why am I showing a plant leaf here? So um, what another university did actually was film a plant leaf in a soundproof room with a radio next to it. And by only monitoring the vibration of the plant leaf, they're able to recover the sound of the radio and the song on the radio, and they actually shazammed it on their phone and were able to fully recover the audio just from the light. So the analogy here is to think of the plant leaf as a solar panel on a satellite and, and the um, acoustic modulation instead of the radio as a thruster fire event. We'd like to do the same thing here to help characterize what event actually occurred on board. So again, we only get the photometric data on the left there, and these two uh, spectrograms on the right, without any context, you probably don't know what event generated those. Um, again, if anyone has any guesses without knowing what those are and are able to identify what events created those signals, let me know. I know. <laughs> but the top, the top spectrogram on the right there in green is the sound of the Indian Ocean crashing on the shoreline, and the bottom right there is the sound of a crowd clapping and cheering at a sporting event. But you wouldn't know that until you, you, you played it. Machine, the machine learning alg algorithms and pattern recognition algorithms may be able to group those together and say, hey, the same event generated this, but you're not going to be able to understand what that event is until you play it back and help correlate, the train the algorithms and act as sort of a machine human interface to you know, help 
train them to understand and actually determine, was it a thruster fire? Was it the articulation of an antenna or a scan, spinning scan mirror or a momentum wheel desaturation? So this method, the intent of this method is to be able to identify what actual event occurred on board. So we, we tried to do exactly that. We collected on 30 unique satellites in all orbital regimes, 20 hours of data, mainly white noise. Yes, I did listen to all of it, and yes, my ears are still ringing. But um, I'm going to show you some of the data that we collected. Uh, we haven't correlated a maneuver yet. Um, there are some anomalous events we're still working to determine what exactly they are. And the first video of the ground test of the thruster fire uh, was a proof of contact. Uh, proof of concept to see if we could actually just take a video and generate audio from that, and that's what we did here. So hopefully it'll play here. Should be going here. Yep. So this is a, the plume ignition of a ground test. You're going to hear the audio of the actual dissipation uh, coming up here shortly. It's just purely due to quality reasons. So that's purely from the video. There's no microphones. So that last event there is very uh, tempting to call a short burst cola maneuver. Um, we confirmed with the operator it wasn't a maneuver, but we're still working to determine if it correlates to any other onboard activities. Um, so with that, I'll leave the conclusions up here for you to read. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Justin. Our next speaker is Dr. Mark Skinner who is with the Aerospace Corporation as the Senior Project Leader for Space Traffic Management. Where are they? Hi. Can you hear me OK? Um, so I'm going to talk about small satellites. And small is sort of a moving target. It depends on what your state of the art is. So. In, in today's day, things are small if they're aboard or a 1U CubeSat, 10 centimeters, something like that. In, in LEO, um, maybe slightly larger at GEO. Um, and so this, the genesis of this was a few years ago at a Nisoy when Paul Curvin asked us, say, you know, things are getting smaller. How, what are we going to do? How, how can we track these things? Um, if you are you know, into the, the radiation gathering business, i.e. telescopes or radar dishes, you know that the radiation power uh, that you can gather goes as the square of the radius. So as you increase the radius of your telescope or your radar dish, you can get you know, so R squared more. However, the cost goes up as R cubed. So it behooves us to come up with techniques and technologies that allow us to more accurately understand uh, the behavior and locations of small objects that are otherwise hard to, hard to look at. From a space traffic management perspective, um, this becomes certainly important. If you, you, know, you look back at the start of the space age, back in the day, Sputnik would be considered a sort of a small satellite. If you've ever seen it, you go to, go to Russia and see it. It's about the size of a bowling ball or, or a cantaloupe, so it's not exactly big. It had an RF beacon. Um, turns out the Russians didn't actually have a satellite surveillance capability, and they, they didn't know about it until they read it that we had tracked it in the paper, a bit of historical uh, stuff there. Um, some techniques I'm going to talk about can return a satellite ID, so you know what it is. It's maybe self-reporting. Some return a trajectory, and some return both. Um, there are active versus passive kinds of things, where active requires basically some sort of electromagnetic radiation be transmitted from the ground to the spacecraft to sort of interrogate it or to illuminate it. Passive uh, relies on energy transmitted or ambient energy coming directly from the spacecraft. Then there are oddball novel techniques that don't really fit into the above categories. Um, this is what sort of limits what we can do. This is the atmosphere and the atmospheric transmission to radiation uh, over a wide range of things from gamma rays down to extremely low frequency. You see we have some windows uh, where we can see through the atmosphere. One primary window is here in the, in the uh, optical, which includes some UV, the visible light, um, some near IR, and some long wave infrared. 
and then you have another window in the radio frequency. But beyond that, you're basically not going to see it through the atmosphere. So if you want information that's gathered in that wavelength regime, you've got to put a sensor in space and then convert that information into um, either optical or radio and send it down to the ground. Um, there are some standard, I won't going to go through this, there are standard space surveillance network tracking techniques that deal with, with visible, with optical light, with radar, and how they do that. Um, but what we want to look at is additional techniques that can be brought to bear, especially if you're starting off to do a, a space traffic monitoring capability. So um, how do we lessen the impacts of, of small satellites, nanosats, um, on the space situation awareness of space traffic management operations. So they're often at the limits of detectability. Um, and a lot of times, they're identical. A 1U CubeSat looks like a 1U CubeSat looks like a 1U CubeSat. Oftentimes, they're released, as we know, scores at a time. And they come off. A lot of times, they're unpowered due to safety reasons. They don't necessarily, the operators don't know which one's which. Where do we point our dish? Which one do we track? and they can't really talk about it. It's like it could take a while before the, the catalog gets, gets everything sorted out before people talk to things. Um, it can be hard to tell them apart. Um, and you know, given the experimental and educational nature of many of the smaller satellite missions, the owner-operator tenure uh, can be a lot shorter than the orbital lifetime of the object. The kids graduate from Doug Levero's daughter's middle school, or they've dropped out of college, or no one has any funding because that was a two-year program, but the object is still up there, maybe for five years, 25 years, what have you. Um, so how could STM regulators, for example, and future, looking forward, owner-operator partner to mitigate some of the impacts that this has on space operations? Um, so what I want to do is identify technologies that owner-operators could choose when they're, when they're architecting their mission that would allow them to be more visible or more trackable or somehow self-report their information. Also, better communication, another aspect of this is better communications be before, during, and after the active phase of mission. It's also very helpful to uh, STM regulators. For the systems themselves, the tracking systems, um, novel techniques um, for tracking of these small objects uh, can help, you know, you know, get better information on them. New classes of information feed into uh, things that Mariva has been looking into. And, um, and some, some of these techniques can be used on existing space objects. They don't necessarily have to have incorporated some new technology. They can be done on existing debris or other things that are already up there. Um, you want to, some, some of these things you want to do it in a machine-to-machine -machine fashion so that you have, uh, you're not, you know, being, being done, you know, hampered by the speed of humans, but allowing things to go machine to machine, especially that's key for things that are going to be sort of electric propulsion thrusting continuously um, to know where they are, where they're going. Also, this reduces the burden on the existing infrastructure for uh, radar, optical tracking facilities, and potentially gives better accuracy. For the owner-operators, um, uh, the suggested technologies enhance their RF or optical signature of their space object and the self-reporting of the object, uh, which I think is also quite good. And one would like to eventually come up with a mechanism by which this can be done through the entire mission phase, even after the active mission phase when the object is, say, debris and hasn't yet deorbited. Um, so that would be kind of interesting to be able to do that. So uh, here's a first case. And, and this, is, uh, this research is leading up to, I'm hoping to present these, these results in a more detailed fashion at the IAC in Washington this October. But uh, this is a preview of that. So active illumination using optical lasers or radar. Um, so we have RF techniques. And one, one thing is, is uh, KA band radar reflector panels. These are uh, being developed that can be uh, applied uh, to, the, to the object um, before it's launched or during its construction. They're sort of stick-on panels that have, and they can be made to uh, have a unique um, signature to, like KA band radar. The uh, there's some um, there's some open source literature on this. There's the Navy's also doing research on this, and another technique um, if for RF is having unique deployable booms or masts or antennas. So, for example, if you're a quarter U CubeSat, and you talk to uh, a commercial um, radar operator about what your, what your de antenna 
configuration. It looks like even though you're so small, you may be much more visible in, in spite of what other people might have been thinking, although this may not lead you out of the doghouse until you pay your fine. Um, optical techniques, uh, so putting a corner cube reflector on your satellite. Um, so there's the International Laser Ranging Service, uh, which is, uses lasers and they illuminate satellites that have corner cube reflectors. And they currently are pushing towards, um, they get centimeter level range accuracy of these objects, even LEO, MEO, GEO. Um, if they are pushing to do millimeter level, I mean, that's really pretty amazing when you think about it. Their goal is not to track necessarily space debris or space objects. It's to do geodesy, to do really high precision geodesy. However, um, if you just illuminate with these networks, you can get meter level precision um, with lasers, which I think is pretty amazing. Now, it's n hard to do in a, you know, sort of a macro thing, but for certain high value things, like things that potentially could collide, you might want to be able to get to, to reduce that error ellipse of the object that you're tracking down to much smaller. If you really collapse it, then you could, then you could certainly do a much better job if you're doing collision avoidance. And these, tech, these technologies are available, they're COTS, and they can be done now. So a second case is reflected or emitted object energy from an object. Again, RF techniques. One thing that's being used for CubeSats is multi-ground site radio time of flight ranging. Um, so the, there's a BIRDS project out of Kyoshu University that's doing this. It's a, it's a multinational consortium of CubeSat operators and ground stations that allow one to do this, and they can come up with really good uh, both position and ID on these objects. Um, you can also just take advantage of um, man-made um, RF signals that are in space, for example, FM radio, uh, stray TV signals from, from broadcast, um, and GNS satellite services. The, the reference there, or the picture on the pig, shows how you can um, use those reflected and comparing them with the uh, um, original transmitted signal to, uh, to do Doppler ranging on objects. And this has been demonstrated in Australia at the uh, Square Kilometer Array, as well as other places. Um, so optical techniques, um, looking at objects that are in eclipse, when, which are maybe normally hard to see in uh, the optical because they're, they're in the dark, but you can look at reflected earth shine. You can look at long wave infrared emission, self emission for objects in eclipse, or even during the daytime um, when when that's possible, because that, that cuts off a lot of the visible reflected sunlight. Then there is a number of uh, what we'll call precision characterization techniques using filter photometry, uh, spectroscopy, um, looking in shortwave infrared, looking in UV, um, that allow you to characterize objects to distinguish you know, unique uh, features that allow you to do feature-rated tracking. Um, and so that's another technique that uses existing assets in a new way, not necessarily going to bigger telescopes, but using existing telescopes um, to allow you to do these sorts of things. Um, I think Matt has, had been, had looked, and others have looked at using um, some of the photometry data that you might get on a geodes telescope, which uh, adds in, is, is a quote unquote feature that allows you to do some tracking. I think another key, a third case is interrogating an object itself, asking the object for interface, information on itself. So uh, looking at RF techniques, um, one key thing to remember is that due to domestic and international law, you can't have an always on RF beacon just transmitting all the time. There has to be some way of, of turning it off and turning it back on. So um, what you can do is you can, you can put on um, some way of transmitting orbital information from an onboard GPS receiver. And this is what a lot of CubeSats are doing now. They're, they're, uh, they're getting GPS transceivers, which are credit card size things. They fit well into their envelope. And so you can use this via um, an Iridium radio or a Global Star radio. Again, credit card size kind of radio. And, uh, and I've talked to Matt Desch at Iridium, and, and this low bandwidth service is actually, uh, I think, a key part to space safety. Um, so they're, they're on board with that. Uh, also, onboard RFID, um, that particular uh, circuit diagram over there where you, you, you zap something and it energizes the circuit and it transmits back to you uh, an RFID, which can have just an ID or can also have some sort of signature that's in there. Optical techniques, um, Los Alamos is working on a project called Elroy that 
that sends out uh, via coded laser pulses. Um, and then there are folks that are doing um, some things with single or multicolor LEDs in sort of a Morse code kind of fashion. And then uh, finally, we have other techniques, um, soft X-ray spectroscopy, which is uh, the, they're doing something to look at doing that on the moon, but this could be, this could be um, implemented for uh, man-made space objects. Uh, you need a space-based X-ray telescope, and th then you have to send that telescope down from there. Um, if you deploy something like, like yeah, just a sec, if you deploy something um, like a balloon or a mylar sail, then you've done two things. You've also increased the RF and the optical cross-section of that object, and you also can deorbit it more quickly. Um, and then the finally resolved commercial imagery. Uh, there's uh, Chandra here in Texas, which I think is going to go up. They have certain licensing capabilities that they're going to allow. You've got to get close, um, so there's some regulatory conditions for non-consenting objects. But uh, that is a way to distinguish things by going up close and taking a picture of it. So in conclusion, um, there are these new techniques, technologies. There, 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 a lot of them are not new. I've just sort of gathered them together. These will be of interest to STM um, regulators and operators. And uh, I think a there's a lot of interest in this from the community. People want to do the right thing. Also, if you are involved in looking at things and 99% of the objects are self-reporting, if you know where they are, you can then concentrate your resources on the 1% that aren't. So that's, for some, that's very important. Um, but it allows one to make a market. And then I think probably the most important of this, the selected re references, if you want to go and read more about these things. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Skinner. Our next speaker is Himanshu Kalida from the University of Arizona. He's pursuing his PhD in the Space and Terrestrial Robotic Exploration Lab. His interests include dynamics and control, space robotics, and evolutionary algorithms. Yeah, uh, good evening. So today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, lasers for Lasers for, uh, are you able to hear? Yeah, okay. Lasers for uh, communications and control of uh, spacecraft swarms. So the outline is like I will quickly go over the motivation and challenges, then give a brief uh, system overview, then implementation, implementation pathway, then discussions and conclusions. Okay. So motivation. So uh, usocial insect swarms. Uh, so we try we are trying to like actually uh, mimic these insects okay so the idea is like a whole it's greater than the sum of the parts so uh, swarms they can solve a complex task using many individuals where each of the individuals they are simple they low cost and disposable okay and how they do it they do it by organization and these insects, they have actually survived more than two extinction events over the last uh, 400 million years. And we think it's because they know how to organize themselves and work as a team. So, but what are the challenges? So current ground control systems, they can't scale up to swamps. Okay, the challenges become, uh, it be, it's mainly because of the coordination between, between, uh, between humans and robots, okay? So, and actually humans, they are the weakest link. It's, it's very unintuitive for humans to understand uh, swarm control. So our goal is to actually minimize the ratio of uh, humans to robots. So this is actually one of the study performed by my advisor during his PhD. Uh, it's actually comparing the performance of humans versus uh, machine learning methods to actually uh, come up with uh, uh, controllers for multiple robots. Okay, as you can see, uh, like G is basically a handwritten, the performance of handwritten code. So as the number of robots increases, its actually performance decreases. However, using machine learning techniques, you can actually achieve more uh, fitness or more performance. So, here, our idea is actually uh, to use the conductor model, or basically 
how a musical conductor performs. Uh, they are able to actually control a large group of people to uh, perform the same task. Okay, so the state of the art control uh, approaches for autonomous systems. They include like joystick control for like drones or something <laughs> like that, or like gamepad control uh, for like ground vehicles. Okay, but what's the future? The future is actually gesture control. Okay, as shown by one of the movies by Steven Spielberg. So actually, like full degree of freedom of uh, human movement to actually control autonomous systems. Okay. So there are like many advantages. It's very intuitive. It's very easy to learn, and it actually utilizes a broad range of sensory motor skills. Okay, and it can actually have the potential for scaling up. And disadvantages: there is a need for like motion capture for highest reliability, and it can do like sluggish recognition and accept, uh, applicability. Is it applicable for wide range? So uh, for extending our work for like gesture control to space, okay, so the main question is like what's the control volume or like what's the control device and how do you track, localize, interpret states and change of states from a control device, okay? So what's the answer? So our answer is uh, we can use laser beams, okay? So the system layout is actually with ground control, you can actually send gesture commands to a control spacecraft that can actually control spacecraft swarms through uh, lasers that can be detected with like so-called smart skins, which, which I will like, cover in the later slides, and with, uh, for, along with like a camera tracking system. And this can actually give us an idea of like how to control more than one or like a uh, swarm of uh, spacecraft using like gestures, okay? So in this case, our solar panels, they can act as a uh, detecting device, okay? So if you shoot a laser on a solar panel, each of these solar cells, they can act as like pixels, and by moving a laser signal on top of it, it can detect the movement of the laser, and that can act as a control command. So yeah, as I told, like the solar panels, they actually uh, uh, cover the largest surface area on a typical spacecraft. So and our work has actually shown that laser beams, particularly of the wavelength of like 450 nanometer and 405 nanometer, they can even be detected under daylight. And that is, I'm talking about Phoenix. Uh, it's very bright out there, okay. So these solar panels, they can work as a gesture pad, and each of these cells, they can be, they can act as a gesture pixel, okay? And by moving a laser on the solar panel, you can actually uh, figure out the source, its velocity, and acceleration. And also, our, in our case, just because you can like actually point a laser to a spacecraft or any robot, it doesn't mean that you can actually control it, okay? So security is very essential, and the laser beam itself, that will be modulated to encode for password strings. The basic architecture here is actually from a ground station. Suppose if you have direction actuators and a laser transmitter, you can actually code it using a microcontroller, and then using adaptive optics, you can point it towards a, uh, the solar panels of a satellite, okay? The solar panel, panel, based on the movement of the laser signal, it understands the command and can actually <coughs> actuate like uh, the ADCS and propulsion to actually do an orbital maneuver or basically follow a swarm command or something like that, okay? And it, the other uh, advantage of this is actually, you can also do a bi-directional communication where if you have actuated reflector uh, modulators, you can actually, by sending one signal, you can actually reflect it back and get the feedback from the spacecraft. And it, uh, it can be actually extended to communication between 
one spacecraft turned into spacecraft using the same philosophy. So like just for an example, like some of the gestures that can be used is like, okay, suppose if my laser swipes from one end to another end, it can mean like, okay, it's a like a, a long track formation flying command, okay? If it's a like circle, it's a like projected circular formation flying command. Or if it's like this, okay, it can mean like it's a circular formation flying command, okay? And similarly, you can actually uh, select a particular spacecraft to be a part of a group and select a, a spacecraft among a group to be a leader, okay? And you can actually uh, like lock the position of the satellite relative to the source, or you can actually unlock it, okay? So these very basic and uh, very simple commands, they can actually help to come up with like more sophisticated control. So yeah, you can just like, okay, uh, you can actually among a group of satellites, you can just like select which one to belong to a group and then select which one is a leader, okay? And then command the entire swarm to follow a common, common goal, okay? And also, with the help of macro programming, you can actually select a, sp a spacecraft and give a maneuver or give a gesture command and then test it out and then approve it or cancel it. Okay, so it can actually be literally your like remote controller with, with which you can actually say, okay, this command is good and this is not rejected, okay? So for uh, just a experimental setup, okay, we tried it out with ground robots. It's a very simple robot, okay, with the Arduino Nano and four solar panels. And our command was like, Okay, if I move a laser signal along this way or that way, it actually understands like, oh, you, I have to turn uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise, okay? If I do a gesture command forward or backward, it understands, so I have to throttle up or throttle down. So this is a simple demonstration where basically we were able to start the robot, move it, and also stop it, okay? With just, and this was a, just a laser pointer like this one. Okay, and with solar cells on top of it. So this idea, it might be helpful for the STM community, uh, like controlling multiple spacecrafts at the same time, okay? And so we have plan to actually validate our technology. So we are actually uh, uh, like pro proposing a CubeSat <coughs> mission where we want to carry two two U cubesats, and each of these cubesats they have like these smaller femtosats. Okay, and the two two U cubesats they act as a gesture control craft, and then the femtosats they follow commands from the control craft. Okay, and the uh, the femtosats they are very small actually. They are actually three centimeter by three centimeter uh, cubes with miniature electronics and uh, MEMS-based uh, electrospade thrusters. Okay, so the concept of operation is like you deploy, you calibrate the spacecraft, deploy the femtosats, and then after deploying the femtosats, you do the laser beam gesture commands, okay? First try it out with very simple architecture and then go towards like more complex patterns. Conclusion. Okay, use of gestures to control swarms, it opens up a like, whole new possibility of human-machine hybrid control. Okay, gestures are intuitive, they're easy to learn and pleasant, and gestures, they enable projecting the gestures over long distances. So lasers actually enable it. And then laser signal modulated with encrypted passcodes to maximize security. Okay, proposed a plan to validate the technology in space. Thank you. Thank you, Himanshu. Uh, we have a lot of time for questions, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Yes. I, I assume by the number of people who had eyes closed during the session that you were all in deep thought thinking about what questions you could find. Thank <laughs> you.
still in this. We're still in this. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I can see that. There's this thing. You can come up on the podium and ask, or okay, yeah, no, right there. Turn. That's good. Yeah. All right. My question is for uh, Dr. Fufaro. Hello. Hey, Brian. Uh, Brian Flewelling at Exo Analytic. So you were showing the uh, training of several different models predicated on doing different dynamics with three or four different objects and then trying to apply that model. Did you do any type of calculations on like a confusion matrix in the signals oh, yeah. themselves? I, <laughs> show, uh, I showed it uh, there um, uh, and it's also in the paper. I can show you more, okay. more details there. But the thing was the following, uh, and unfortunately I apologize because I had to go around, you know, fairly quickly and maybe, you know, with the, the, with the thing. So I didn't show the confusion matrix for the, uh, for the um, uh, deep learning parts, uh, but we know we didn't do it simply because the way it trains in Python directly output, uh, you know, the, the accuracy both on the testing and on the validation. Right, so I didn't need to do yeah, just, that. Just internal to the signals themselves, however, there's a space of ambiguity within light curve inversion of multiple objects can still look similar R within the parameter spaces you're trying to parse. Right, right, right. So there is still but a theoretical lower bound that you may have actually reached or gotten reached. closer yeah, to reaching right. than the other algorithms. And I think that the lower theoretical bound is the, on the validation set because the validation set, they never see the, they never seen the samples during the training, okay? However, we have the uh, confusion matrix for the other mm -hmm. uh, techniques. Um, uh, what you see that mostly there was a confusion for, for the real data. For the simulated data, there was no problem whatsoever. For the real data, the problem was much tougher. If you look also at the confusion matrix that I plot, however, for the standard technique, there was a big confusion, for example, between rocket body and, and spacecraft. Right. Okay. That was huge, and it did get a lot of uh, false positives there. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and, um, uh, you know, I, I think this was the initial proof of concept for this. You know, they were most interested. One of the concepts they were very interested in is uh, uh, this transfer learning concept where we think we can improve on the real data. Uh, we're not convinced that the data that we, we have uh, acquired, because we use the metadata face value on the real you know, curves that we got from the, from the telescopes. And uh, the problem is that they were labeled something, right? And we have no way to say, to see if they were labeled correct or not. And we know that in machine learning, 80% is the way you curate the data. Mm -hmm. So we suspect that the fact that the, even the deep learning is not able to get above 90%, there might be some... Uh, some uh, well, so that's kind of one interesting way that your methodologies and others maybe propose a, a collaborative opportunity, which is whether it's taking similar light curves from several coordinated locations on the yeah. planet of the same object or different modalities of data, can you end up with training sets that perform better and are more, the, the classification efficiency is, is higher uh, and maybe more preferred as an operational way to observe these objects as opposed to just assuming this is the only data type you're gonna get. Yeah. and do the best you can. I think uh, if you look at what people do in another uh, community where they, for example, remote sensing or, you know, they have standard data set where they, train, where they test their algorithm. And we don't have something like that for, uh, for this kind of techniques. And I, it's, the problem is expensive to collect, but we should have a coordinated effort to create a golden data sets that can be used for. Um, we show that in... In uh, simulated data, we have light curves, you know, uh, models. Uh, there is no really great advantage between uh, deep learning and non-deep, uh, but those are also controlled data, and I don't like it mm -hmm. too much. Well, we put it there for comparison, but yeah, no, makes sense. Thing. Thank you. Oh, no, it's not. No. I just, <laughs> it's just a habit. Uh, this is also for Dr. Fafaro. Um, I'm Nathan Toner from Harris Corporation. Uh, oh, I had two questions. I'll start with one. Uh, for the uh, CNN model that you're using, did you start with a pre-trained model and then just train the fully connected layers, or did you train the full thing? Because one of the images looks like you're only training the fully connected layers. All right. So uh, I started from scratch. There okay. is a reason. And the reason is because most of the convolutional networks work with images. Right. Those are not images. Yeah. However, we're trying to do, we, 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 we consider these light curves as one-dimensional images, basically. Mm 
mm -hmm. right? So we started from scratch, and of course, when you start from scratch, what's, you know, it's, uh, it takes time consuming to try to tune it, right? Um, uh, so uh, we found the solution. We tried different layers and different combinations. I didn't report it, but uh, we found that this works, uh, you know, fairly decently, right? Um, and um, but then what we did, we tested this on simulated data, and then we used the same architecture, right? For simulated data, also for real data. So in some sense, we pre-trained with simulated okay. data to deal with real data. Right. That was kind of my follow-up: was did you retrain on the real data? Or? Yes, I retrain. Okay. I, I didn't change. We didn't change the architecture on the real data because okay. we said, you know, so if you look at the at the simulated data, we we, we reached. 98% accuracy, we were happy. Right. And then uh, on the training, uh, on the real data, of course, it's lower, but, you know. I'd, yeah, I'd be interested to see. I, I was also kind of wondering whether there was any uh, kind of work done or interest in doing any work on, for instance, like gener generative adversarial networks in order to do that domain transfer from your simulated data to the more realistic looking data and how much those sets diverge from one another. If yeah. it's a fairly large difference, I would expect that. Yeah, that's a good point. We looked at, we started looking at generative adversarial networks, but mm -hmm. we're not there yet. I think sure. the ne next step we want to do is this concept of transfer learning mm -hmm. from simulated data to real data, which mm -hmm. we didn't do it. We pre-trained it somehow in the sense like we used the same architecture, but the training was from scratch. Right. What I, I think I'd like to do next is to take broader, really literally millions of light curves generated through the, uh, uh, through the simulated models and then train only the top layers. Mm -hmm. That is, the assumption, even with a smaller data set, so maybe the collection of uh, light curves that we need is not order of hundreds of thousand. It can be even, uh, you know, as small as 500. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that if we capture, if we have a light curve models that capture the physics, the physics is contained into the, I, 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 during the training, you know, the simulated, all the lower layer capture the features, that is the physics at different levels, Right, and then the top layer and the real data just refine from that. The assumption is that it might work better, but it's not guaranteed, of course, until we try. Um, any chance that you're going to release your simulated data for public? Oh yeah, yeah, we can. We, I can. Great, yeah, right. sure. Thank you. Hey, uh, uh, Steve Massey, Slingshot Aerospace. It's a question for Justin Spurbeck, actually. Um, I. Wondered if you found a useful lower bound on your optical sensor used for your detection and your simulation, or if you just used as a baseline the, uh, the telescope that you used later on in the sure. project. So I'm not going to claim to be the optical expert of our group. I heavily relied on the CERC and EOS systems team who did all the optics at Mount Stromlo um, in Australia. Um, as far as characterizing our sensor, the sensitivity and signal to noise, field of view type stuff, there were some initial things that were done uh, there. We even collected dark, you know, with the dome closed, things like that. But I, I, I can't claim to speak 100% to those details, but uh, the co-authors on some of the papers we've done, um, and uh, Daniel Kucharski, who's, Dr. Kucharski, who's here at UT with us, would probably be able to answer those questions a little more directly. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience? Well, since I got asked the question, I'm going to turn the table to confirm the favor. Uh, question. We've done a lot of good discussion about some smaller areas, or maybe not smaller, but discrete areas, let me say it that way, on this topic. The question I have, and it probably goes back to Dr. Jazz's initial presentation, is, and I invite the entire panel to respond if, you know, one all, um, and I know we're running out of time, but um, what about orbit determination? How, how, do we, how do we get to a point, you know, we've talked about data formats and trying to get that to be a standardized thing, at least where we're speaking in, uh, you know, we, I, I work a lot with our English allies, our English-speaking allies, and we always kid around and say we're, we're five nations divided by a common language. Um, but how do we get beyond that type of a thing where we um, understand each other, how we determine orbits? Because to me, that's a, that's a hugely beneficial thing for that probably lies at the, at the nucleus or close to the nucleus of doing it right.
one of the things that I learned <clears throat> when I worked for NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab was uh, doing a lot of parametric type analysis to try to tease out truth, uh, for lack of a better term. The way that I would approach orbit determination is I would take people's solutions and basically use people's solutions to predict their data. So it's like, if, if your solution is really relevant, then when you predict other people's observations, the differences between what you predict and the actual observations should be well behaved, uh, assuming that the sensor uh, is performing uh, uh, the, the proper way. Um, and, and, and so being able to look at, at uh, those sorts of comparisons as well as given anybody's solution, predict, predict other uh, observations into the future, how well are you able to do that? Uh, I, think, I think those sorts of things are, are the ways that we need to do stuff. I remember working with the European Space Agency on Mars Express at JPL, and those are the sorts of things that we did because we didn't share software, uh, but we did do software comparison tests, and we did process each other's data, and we compared our orb orbit determination, and we did find inconsistencies. Some of the things that they brought up we found mistakes that we were doing and vice versa. And I think that's kind of the way that we, we need to kind of crowdsource it uh, that way. But Yeah, I would take it to the observation level, the measurement level. Um, if you have an orbit and I have an orbit, we just can't take the two orbits to divide by two and come up with a better orbit. But if you have observations and I have measurements as well, we can fit an orbit to those. And if we are realistic about our measurement uncertainties, then I think we can come up, we can do an orbit determination that has realistic covariances. Now, if you are prohibited from releasing your measurements, then that's a challenge um, to, to do that. But I, I think that there are possibly some techniques that Mariba alluded to that would allow you to um, generate pseudo measurements that could potentially be doing that. But that's, that's um, fixing a problem that you've made for yourself, basically. I have an additional comment. To I this. Have an alibi on that, Mark. Yeah. That's not a problem I made for myself. It's a problem that the Missile Warning Committee, uh, community made for It stays within the bubble. So to, to complement a little bit, uh, you know, the two answers, uh, I think that one of the problems that we're having, and this is not only for ob orbit determination, uh, also for object characterization, we don't have a common uh, standards or even a common platform, so to speak, to compare these objects and uh, assign, uh, you know, uh, scores to the different techniques, right? And uh, actually, Moriba and I have a common a cooperative agreement with the, the Air Force where we're trying to build, you know, this type of platforms where people can share algorithms and share data and finally, you know, compare one or each other to understand the strengths and the values and how they do one with each other. This is not just for orbit determination. This is for a lot of other things, including, as I said, you know, understanding behavior of the object, characterization, classification, yeah. So. Any additional comments? I know we've got one more person in the audience waiting for asking a question, so go ahead. I have a question for Justin. I was wondering if you could elaborate on how you converted the photometric uh, data into acoustic data, uh, including what process you used, are there multiple processes in the literature? How did you pick the one you used and did you alter it at all to fit your specific goals for your research? Sure, that's a great question. Thanks, Erica. Um, so to answer that question, it's really to answer how the human ear works. Um, essentially, I have a lot of really tiny uh, hairs. I forget the name of them since I'm not really a medical person, but they're modulated by a wave uh, in a transmission medium, typically the air on Earth by some sort of source, typically a diaphragm and a speaker. But the modulation of that air uh, wiggles the hair, which convert, uh, converts it to an electrical impulse, which your brain interprets as sound. So really, at the end of the day, anything with some sort of vibrational or frequency content can just simply be changed to, in, in, mar in our case, the photometric data. Um, you get a max intensity value for light and a zero. You can literally scale that from zero to one um, save it as a matrix and plug it into audio read in MATLAB and it'll produce a sound. And essentially all that does is just modulate the speaker at that frequency. And now that's fundamentally what sound is. 
and the uh, example of the plant leaf that I showed um, shows that it works. It's it's obviously not perfectly clear HD audio. There's some there's some muffling to it, and there's potentially some information lost there just in the damping of the plant leaf itself. But the, the, the fact that a plant leaf can act as a speaker and then your phone can shazam a song that was recovered from that data is pretty cool. If that totally answers your question, hopefully. It does. And based on what you said, I have a follow-up question. You sure. mentioned the damping. And you also mentioned um, a little bit in your talk as well as in your paper about the idea of um, estimating additional parameters for the spacecraft. Are you able to in any way use prior information about how a solar panel would damp or estimate parameters as to how the solar panel would damp based on the information that you get back? So that's a very good question as well. Um, there is an interesting problem that's been posed called uh, essentially an inverse problem or sometimes called regularization where you try to derive the forcing function of an object just based purely on the output. Um, I think that's pretty far down the line for me personally because we're still at the basics of, you know, can we get any, drive any mass properties or, or thrust type properties. But in theory, if you can get those, there may be some sort of dynamics or forcing function through the regularization process that would potentially allow you to say it's not this shape or it's not that shape or maybe it's this type of shape. And, and from that, you may be able to get some sort of area or some sort of, you know, structural-like property from there. But that's still, that's, that's, that's a full PhD's worth of work right there, probably. So. Thank you. Yep, thanks, Sarah. Mark, Marcus, Marcus has a question. So we're still about, we still got about five more minutes. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Marcus Bever. I'm another, another of uh, Dr. Marie Bajal's students. Uh, Dr. Skinner, I had a question for you. You had mentioned the advantages of including some of these tracking technologies in spacecraft that are being developed for the future, specific, uh, specifically for the smaller ones. But do you ever think there's a use case for deploying such technologies on existing resident space objects? Perhaps there's a debris piece that has been notoriously difficult to track in the past. something on there, for example, that would be really expensive. Um, if you're going to go do that, you might as well grab it and take it down, right? If you've solved that problem, you might as well just remove it then, you know, and just be done with it. But uh, that's why I think that it, realistically it's, it's, it's not impossible to do that, but for small things it's probably hard and uh, cost a lot of money. So um, it makes more sense to build them into new, new, these capabilities and new objects and, and launch them that way. And then come up with some way to track those things that are otherwise hard to track using existing objects. I mean, you look at what's the budget for space traffic management, and I, I think uh, the current appropriation was less than what was hoped for by a factor of about five. Uh, so uh, there we are. Thank you. Dr. Jones. Brandon Jones, UT Austin, Mariba's colleague, not student. Uh, question for uh, Mr. Spurbeck. On uh, you said that you need to have track the maneuver through ramp up, execution, and ramp down. Um, I was curious, uh, especially for low thrust spacecraft, those maneuvers last long times. What if you catch it mid maneuver? What happens? I just was curious uh, how that affects the approach and what you got. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I have considered the inability to capture a full arc, and just to clarify, um, we don't technically need, at least in the initial studies I've done, the entire event duration. We're able to, if we just get essentially this, the event genesis epoch and termination epoch, then you can essentially resolve your state afterwards and still do the full estimation. If you do get only, say, half half of an arc or ha like halfway through the maneuver, then it becomes more challenging. Um, you may have to rely on some of your estimation techniques to fill in any gaps. Um, I, haven't sent, I haven't studied any of those sort of uh, cases at the moment, but I think you could probably connect the dots just based on, you know, standard estimation techniques. I know you're familiar with this and we're working on that, but 
if you catch it halfway, you can use potentially your uncertainty bounds and a threshold to say, hey, this is getting close to you know, my, my uncertainty. And you, you may be able to say, hey, this is actually looking like a maneuver has started to occur. If you didn't catch the event genesis, that may keep, clue you in. Um, and then again, even if you only get half of it, you can still use the end, the end epic and then backtrack and say, hey, let's fit the orbit only from that point on and then see where it actually uh, becomes more of a, a, a nominal trajectory with no unmodeled dynamics. And you may be able to piece it together. Um, but again, I appreciate the question. It's a great question. I haven't typically studied that yet. So, can I, can I add so sure. we, we did some research out on Maui, and we called it microvibrometry. We had a group from uh, some of our colleagues from Boeing came out. We made some observations of some LEO satellites, uh, sort of blind. Um, and we found signals. The signals were found. However, because this is new, you don't know what these signals are. And we could never determine. They could never determine if they were from the satellite or from the dome or from the mount or whatever. We did try to do a follow-on uh, proposal to uh, the NRO director about looking at some, some things and getting cooperative observations so we could understand what was going on at the time. Because there's lots of things in a spacecraft that move and you know, fluids and drives and, and antennas and things like that. So unless you have some truth, you're never going to figure out what does this sound correspond to? Is it real? Is it just, is it some, you know, movement of the solar panel due to thermal heating? Or is it just something in, that's, you know, instrumental that's in my frequency analyzer or whatever? So it's... Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, that is a good point. As far as determining what event may have occurred on board, there is going to be some sort of, uh, I guess, <coughs> training step per se, because you're right, there are a lot of different unique phenomena that could cause some sort of event on board to cause some sort of signal. So that's why both maybe potentially even grounds testing of those type of events to develop some sort of library that you can compare uh, on orbit signals to as sort of an identification and training step for, again, the inevitable algorithms that will be doing this. Because it's not like we want an array of people with headphones on and sees back. That's simply not, that's not what, we're, what we're asking for here. But you're right, that will be a challenge. But in theory, if you you know, develop that library and comparison data set to help train these things, you may be able to start to um, make those connections. Can I can make a comment about this? If you want to go that route, which is excellent, make sure also that if you do measurements like this, also couple and model to understand the signal, because we have the same problems in another area, which is reflectance of space material. Yeah. And uh, uh, NASA created a huge library, well, not huge, but it's like 500 yeah. spectra, right? But unfortunately, the community never funded any uh, modeling work to understand the signal. So I think uh, your lab work might be able to, you know, to generate a library, but also have a models associated to that that can test against that to interpret the signal. So otherwise, it's going to be tough. So a big round of applause for our panel. And thank you for the wonderful questions. <laughs> <laughs>